Hello, good morning to everyone at ICF. It's uh, lovely to be with you. And uh, thank you, Pastor Robbie and Karen, for the invitation to be part of a new uh, teaching series, uh, which we begin this morning. So greetings from the northeast of England, and uh, it's great to uh, connect with you once again. So that new series that I'm referring to um, is one that you'll be familiar with. You'll, um, Pastor Robbie and others have been taking you through that very uh, key verse, significant verse in Acts chapter 2, where it says, and they continued steadfastly, or they devoted themselves to breaking bread and uh, communion and uh, fellowship. And of course, the, the fourth component of that verse is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so we are starting a new series today, which will run for a few weeks, on what is the apostles' teaching. And, um, and we've put together a number of things that we believe are part of the apostolic teaching, the teaching that the early apostles would have taught in the, in the early church. And so uh, I'm going to start it this morning and uh, behind me over the next few weeks there are a number of our UK-based apostles who will be taking a strand or a component of the apostles' teaching and they will be sharing that with you. So we kick off this morning with a great topic, and the topic is love one another. And uh, I'm spoiled for choice for Bible verses to anchor my talk in this morning, because there are so many, of course. But I think the, the one that I've settled is, is hugely significant, and it's the direct words of Jesus to the disciples and just days before the cross. And uh, Jesus says this, John 13, verse 34 and 35. He says, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Then he says, and by this, the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Loving one another. Now you might be familiar with the quote, um, to dwell above with the saints we love will be glory, but to live below with the saints we know, well that's another story. And uh, we could even unpack that, couldn't we, in, uh, in, in some very, very humorous ways, I'm sure, because um, you know, I often tell people, I've got brothers and sisters in Canada and New Zealand and Australia and different parts of the world. And, and with my hand on my heart, I can honestly say I love them all. Why do I love them all? Because I've never met them. But it's the people that sit opposite me on a Sunday or the people that are part of the same church as me or the people that I see in the fire after church now, that's a different story sometimes, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's not so easy because you know them and they know you and they've rubbed you up the wrong way and they've irritated you or hurt you in the past. And so that's the nuts and bolts of church. And I'm sure we could all write a page or three on the actual nuts and bolts of church. Uh, church is described as a family. And uh, you think of your own family and uh, there are challenges in your family. There's no perfect family, 
and uh, there are challenges perhaps in your family. There have been difficult situations. There have been some awkward personalities. You know, you sometimes some families dread the Christmas get together, or a christening, or a wedding, and and uh, you know they 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 go into these things with fear and dread because of what could kick off and 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 the clash of personalities and all that. And that's in the ordinary family. Well, the church is a family, and of course it's a it's a greater mixed bag than the normal family. And um, people from different backgrounds, different nationalities, uh, different cultures, uh, and, uh, you know, from, from various walks of life. And they're all brought together into this, into this community called the church. And, um, you know, let's make no bones about it. Loving people requires extraordinary efforts on times. There are some people that are easier to love than others. There are some people that perhaps we only just tolerate and we just suppress how we really feel about them for the sake of unity, for the sake of just keeping the peace. But do we love them? If we had a device that perhaps we could measure the depth and the dynamic of love in us for certain people, um, maybe the results would be a bit shocking. You know, in the last few years, we've, uh, lots of churches have adopted a model called Messy Church. And Messy Church, of course, is where children come in and, and they do all kinds of activities with their parents. And it's a bit like a school classroom with steroids, really. It's paint everywhere and, and, and they just have loads of fun. And then, of course, the idea is that you... You, you, you share something of the gospel with them at the end. But, you know, messy church is not new. I mean, you only got to read Corinthians. And you read of a messy church. Hmm? And uh, so the concept of messy church is not new in any shape or form. And, and uh, you know, you might have had, you might have looked sometimes and said, ICF, it's a messy church. Churches that I look after, it's, messy church it's made up of people who just are out of control and and throw comments away and and don't have respect for other people and of course we're all we're all works in progress you know we're all we're all not all imperfect people very often the church is described as god's building site j john describes it that way as god's building site and uh, some people are further on than others. And some people need a bit more uh, help and understanding than others. And, uh, you know, it's very much a coming together of people where, of different backgrounds and persuasions. Uh, and uh, the head of the church, Jesus, who the Bible says loved the church and gave himself for the church, now directly commands us to love one another. But Lord, it's like building with bananas. Love one another. But Lord, you know, her tongue is vicious. Love one another. And it might appear to be a tall order. And it might appear to be very stretching and demanding. But it's a command. It's a command, and it's as equally valid as the Ten Commandments. And we wouldn't think, perhaps, of breaking the Ten Commandments. We may have done, but, you know, we wouldn't deliberately go out and de to break the Ten Commandments. And this is a new commandment, because it's not in the book of Exodus. It makes it no less of importance. Jesus said it, love one another. I read a story recently about a church in Buenos Aires in, in Argentina. And um, the pastor um, was quite reflective about where the church was at and, and the culture of the church. And, and he realised that uh, his church, the majority of his church, was educated beyond their experience, really. They knew a lot more than they were putting into practice. 
to put it quite frankly. And uh, many of them were listening to two or three sermons a week and maybe attending some small groups throughout the week, but they had very little application that was evident in their lives. And, and uh, he saw that, you know, they were, digi- they, were, they were taken in many sermons, but before they had time to digest one and apply it, they were listening to another one. And so he decided that he would bring some change. And so one Sunday morning, he stood up in the pulpit and there was about 500 people in the congregation. And he opened his Bible and he just read the words that I've read at the beginning of this talk. John 13, verse 34. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. The pastor closed his Bible and sat down. He didn't say anything else. The congregation sat in silence. There was a bit of an eerie silence as they waited what next. After a few minutes, the pastor stood up again and he repeated the same words. Love one another as I have loved you. He sat down again. Now the congregation were beginning to get nervous and began to whisper to each other, what's happening? Where is this heading? Then the pastor for the third time got up and said, love one another and you could there was a sense of emotion in his voice as he quoted those words there was a man in the front row who was a faithful member he'd been a member of that church for many decades he leaned over to the man next to him and said i think the pastor wants us to love one another the man thought the man that he spoke to just pondered it for a moment and then looked at the man and said Is there anything I can do for you? Is there any way I can help you? I want to show you that I love you. The man who had been in the church for decades says, no one has ever asked me that. In all the years of coming to this church, no one has ever taken the time to try and express love to me. The man broke down, was emotional. And suddenly, all over the auditorium, people began sharing with each other, turning to the people behind them or alongside them. And the scene was one of, of messiness in some ways. It was, they were praying for each other. There was people crying. There was people hugging each other, laughing. There were people standing up looking for people that they hadn't talked to for, for many, many years and crossing over the aisles, and they were swapping telephone numbers, and, and uh, all the rest of it. It was a scene, it was a messy scene. For the next six months, the pastor preached systematically on that verse. Love one another. The report goes on to say that the culture of the change, the culture of the church changed dramatically. And the pastor giving an interview to a Christian radio in Argentina simply said this, in his view, it's better to practice one verse effectively than know all the verses in the Bible. He said it's better to know one verse and live it out as Christ would want us to live it out than have a, have a bank of verses that we know but not apply them. Selwyn Hughes is a great Christian author, was a, sadly died now. He was a friend of my, my, my dad's and uh, he was a great, great man of God. And, and he had many anecdotes. He had many things that he uh, was, he, many quotes that were memorable. But one of the most memorable quotes from Selwyn is this. Where love is present... It doesn't matter what else is absent. But where love is absent, it doesn't matter what else is present. How weighty are those words? Where love is absent, it doesn't matter what else is present. Good music, good preaching, all the facilities, all the technology, smart building, good income. Where love is absent, It doesn't matter what else is present. But where love is present, 
it doesn't matter what else is absent. We don't have a great budget or we don't have the facilities or we don't have the musical expertise, but what we have is love. And that is the benchmark for any church. You know, Jesus spoke to seven churches in Revelation. It's contained in chapter 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. Remember, he went on a, a tour around these seven churches. They were real churches. And, uh, of course, he comes to the church at Ephesus. And um, just a growing church, a significant church. And, of course, he says, I have one thing against you, uh, that you've lost your first love. And I often think that 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 indictment against that church has been replicated in a lot of other churches today. We have many things, but we are deficient in love. We have many, we have good facilities, good music, good technology, good preaching, but yet we are deficient in love. You know, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul begins four of his letters by thanking God for the love that was evident and reflected in that particular church. In the first 12 or 15 verses of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, he thanks them for the love that they have for one another, the evident love that they have for the saints. Of course, the one glaring omission is the letter to the Corinthians. First Corinthians, he makes no reference to love. And the reason for that is clear, that when you read the whole letter, to put it bluntly, they're all out of love. That's the words of the old song, wasn't it? I'm all out of love. And uh, that was the experience of the Corinthian church. They didn't demonstrate any love. They had a superiority and uh, they were filled with pride. Uh, they had divisions. They, they abused the Lord's table. They had a misunderstanding of gifts and all these other things. And there was a deficit of love. They fell way short. Lots of rhetoric, but a glaringly deficiency in love. They had everything except love. So in reality, they had nothing. They had lots of gifts, but no love. And that's why... 1 Corinthians 13 is there. That's why this hymn of love that is often read in a, in a wedding, it's there, it's, it's preserved in the Corinthian epistle for us. That the hope, that where he speaks of faith and hope and love and says the greatest of these is love. When you think about the Corinthian church, how you know, talk about messy church, as I said earlier, how dysfunctional they were, how disunified they were, how tribal they were, how sectarian they were. And how does Paul deal with it? Paul doesn't come with a big stick, even though there is a measure, good measure of correction in the letter. Really, it's captured in two words. And Paul looks at the state of this church and and the substandard Christianity that he's seeing, he simply says to them, pursue love. Pursue love. Why? Because out of all the things that the church needs to be healthy and to be unified and to be effective, faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus was asked to name the greatest commandment. And, of course, his response was interesting because he felt compelled not only to name one, but two commandments. And, uh, and a lot of people are accepting of the one, but struggle with the other. So Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, etc., etc. And then he says, and love your neighbour as yourself. It's a quote from the Old Testament, of course. Love your neighbour as yourself. But even that was a tall order for a number of people. But now Jesus in the New Testament raises the bar considerably. Because he still uses the term love one another. Because that's nothing new. That's, that goes back. That's, 
That goes back into the Hebrew Scriptures, into the Old Testament. Uh, people were aware of that when they looked at the Hebrew Scriptures, that we should love one another. But Jesus gives us a new commandment. And he brings some, he adds some significant words to that command. So he says, love one another as I have loved you. Now he's adding new depth, new dimension of love. This takes us to a whole new level altogether. We're not just to express our love to our neighbour as we love ourselves, but as Christ loved us unconditionally. He loved us without limits. He loved us without wanting anything in return. And it's agape love. That's the meaning of love. It's agape love. It's the love of Christ that he had for his church. And it's that love. You see, in the, in the Bible, the love of God is, is declared in the Old Testament. There's declarations through the prophets. God says, I love you. Then we see that it's demonstrated in the New Testament. God not only said, I love you, but I'll demonstrate how much I love you. I'll send you my son. God so loved the world, it says. John 3, 16. So his love was declared. His love was demonstrated. And then when we come along, the church, his love is deposited in us. So we carry something of this amazing love of God. Last week at Pentecost, I was speaking about the text of the, the Holy Spirit takes the love of the Father and he sheds it abroad in our hearts. He deposits it within our lives. God declared it through his prophets. It was demonstrated by his Son and now his Holy Spirit deposits that love within us and so that we have the capacity to love one another as Christ loved us. The Bible says we can only love because we have been loved. We first we, we love because we were first loved by him. He has modelled it for us. He has deposited within us. God gives me his love so that I can love him. God gives me his love so that I can love you. Hmm? Well, let's be honest. I mean, we need it, don't we, eh? God gives me his love so I can love those that perhaps are unlovely. Those perhaps outside of the, the, the fold of God at the moment. Uh, those whose lives are just in a total mess. Uh, we love them with agape love. Uh, with the love of the Father. You see, loving one another is a non-negotiable. Jesus specifically presents it as a command. He didn't say, I want to give you a new suggestion. I want to give you a new option. He says, I'm giving you a new command. And you know, the vertical and the horizontal are very much interrelated. You cannot have a relationship with God and claim to love God without loving God's people. The horizontal and the vertical kick into each other. And my relationship with God is contingent on my relationship with his people. That's what John teaches us in the, in the New Testament. John was an apostle of love. It wasn't always that way. He was, he was known as, as a son of thunder, you remember. In the Gospels, he was a known, Jesus dubbed him as a son of thunder. Um, but his relationship with Jesus, his companionship with Jesus, he undergoes a complete change. And he writes the most amazing stuff about love. That first letter of John is dripping with love, isn't it? Dripping with the love of God. His understanding of it. He's the only disciple at the cross, you remember. He accompanied the mother of Jesus. He's the only disciple who stayed faithful to Jesus at the cross. He underwent a complete change and a shift in his thinking. From being perhaps a hot-tempered man to becoming an apostle of love. God says, if you want to love me, you've got to love my people. The church that he loved and gave himself for. We now have to love people. You know, I'm a member of the local library just not far from my house. A few times a year I visit the library when I'm going on holiday just to 
to take in some holiday reading, something different. And, and um, of course, when I go into the library, you've got to be quiet anyway, haven't you? But, but sometimes, you know, you do get to speak to somebody. But more often than not, I go in and I come out within 15 minutes and I haven't spoke to anyone. You know, it's, it's silent anyway. And people are, if people are sat around, they're engrossed in a book or what have you. And, and, uh, but I'm a member and I can go there any time. I can show my card. I'm a member. I belong there. But imagine that happening in church. Imagine coming into church and nobody's speaking to you and just, you know, you're coming in and you're going out. And, but remember, the church is not a club. The church is a community. And there's a different dynamic at work between a club and a community. You know, if we're really honest, and, and the Apostles' teaching is brutally honest, a lot of relationships in church are superficial. We smile, we inquire as to how you are, we maybe roll out the well-worn platitudes uh, and the cliches, uh, but really a lot of it is superficial. But the call of the New Testament is for sacrificial love. That doesn't mean that I have to lay down my life for you. It could come to that. But every time I see you, I want to give and give and give again without ever asking for anything in return. That's the benchmark that Jesus said. It's a sacrificial love. It's an unconditional love. You have to, you have to dig deep sometimes to raise that love for some people, but you've got to do it. Loving one another. You see, love is not a grey area in the Bible. It's not a grey area. Jesus spoke very in plain terms about love. Jesus gave love as the priority over all the virtues, the other virtue, Christian virtues, as did Paul, of course, when he said that we ought to love one another. Every thought, every response, every act of kindness, every gesture of goodwill must pass through the filter of love. You see, the world that we live in, the culture, has a distorted, a polluted view of love. The Bible says that our love for one another should shock the world. It should amaze the world. It should, it should attract new Christians to Jesus. Maybe not through your beliefs, but through your behaviour. In loving one another. You know, they might be sceptical about what we believe, but, you know, I often say to my church, you know, they might be sceptical about what we believe, but let's make them envious of what we've got. Let's make them spiritually curious and envious to come and look because they think, we're not sure about your beliefs, but boy, you don't half have good relationships. You don't half love each other. You don't have to look out for one another. Of course, it's that one another aspect, I think, is going to convince a lot of people that the church is the right place for them. It's not so much about the beliefs that will come. People want to belong. You know, when I grew up in the church, in order to belong, you had to believe. So someone would come, and if you didn't believe, you didn't belong. But we've changed. And now I've got people in my church who feel they belong. Not sure if they've made a commitment yet. I don't think they have. But they would say, I belong to that church. Because I see something there that, that intrigues me, that attracts me. And eventually, of course, they will come to the belief. They will accept the belief of the gospel and, 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 and become Christians. But sometimes people just belong because... They are seeing something that is different to what they see in the world. And that's where the term one another is very important. And notice in the New Testament, it's used dozens of times. One another, care for one another, carry one another's burdens, admonish one another, love one another. It's there for us. Love. You know, it's a verb and you'll know from your school days that a verb is a doing word. It's something we do. It's not passive. It's something we do. It's, it's, um, 
it, 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 it demands something of us. It's not a passive thing, but love is, love is action. God so loved. Hmm? It's not just a sentimental feeling. It should fire us. It should motivate us. It should motivate us to be the people of God that God wants us to be. You know, we going back to those verses in Revelation where Jesus looks in on a church and the all-wise, all-seeing one makes an assessment of that church. There's no need of a second opinion because Jesus has assessed it. There's no need of saying, oh, you know, we'll have a second opinion. We'll appeal against this decision. What's the point? The head of the church sees it as it is, knows everything about it, and comes up with this blunt assessment. You have lost your first love. Uh, you know, we wouldn't want that said about our church. So let's begin to get motivated again. When we come back in person and meet each other again, let's be fired up to say, you know what? I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to sit with people that I've not sat with before. I'm going to start to show hospitality to people that have never showed hospitality to before. It's an interesting uh, statistic that there are many more verses in the Bible that speak of our love for one another and fellow man than there are that speak of our love towards God. There are more verses directing me to love you and you love me than there are for me to, to love God. Wow. See, there's lots of things I love about the church, as I'm sure you do. I love, you know, the fellowship, the friendship, the, the, the partnership that we have together, the praying with people, getting excited about evangelism, listening to people's life stories and the change, the transformation, being part of a, a community of people that are modeling something different and all these things. But really, the thing that should really excite us is that a company of people can come together from different walks of life, from different persuasions, different temperaments, and the Holy Spirit can just merge us together and we become one and we love each other. We have a deep, deep love for one another. We, and it, it enables us to be free, to become the person that God wants you to be. So when you exercise a spiritual gift in ICF, and it maybe goes wrong, or it maybe is not quite, there's not the big stick out, or there's not thou shalt not, but there's love. Or if there's failure, there's failure in the church or what have you, and people have made mistakes, and people are, are repentant about it, you know, we don't sit as judge and jury. But there's grace. And there's love. And of course you think of all the Christian virtues. Compassion, kindness, forgiveness, gentleness, humility. And yet Paul says there's one thing that holds them all together. And that's love. Love covers the sin of others. That's what it says. Love doesn't keep a record of wrong. That doesn't mean to say... That we turn a blind eye to things that are wrong. That we're not indifferent to people's sins and character traits or character faults. Uh, but what we will say is those faults, those shortcomings will not spoil our relationship together. They'll not restrict me. They'll not diminish my love for that person in any way. I will love them through it, through it all. Loving one another. And finally, the last uh, thought I have about love is that love wins outsiders to Christ. You know, a church of loving relationships radiates Jesus. Let's, let's agree today, not only for your church, but this is pertinent to many, many churches. Let's agree today to reject superficiality and embrace authenticity. Let's leave behind the superficial, the pretense, and let's embrace an authenticity, a genuineness 
you know, I assure you, people in the world will see the church for what it is. And if we are superficial in our relationships, they'll so see right through it. We want to be authentic and genuine. A church that is missional and wants to make Jesus known must be a community that loves one another. You see, the devil will do all he can to use the lack of love in the church to just draw, push people away. But where there's love, where there's a community of love, it's like a burning bush. It pulls people in, it draws people in. We must be intentional about loving one another. It doesn't happen by accident. You know, if we are intentional about loving one another, then we will make Jesus known just without without effort. We will ref when we reflect our love for one another, that will just reflect to the world without any effort at all. Loving one another. Why? Because it's evidence of our discipleship. When he came, when he came to selecting a defining attribute for his disciples, Jesus didn't highlight serving or holiness or faith. He chose love. He says, by this the world know that you are my disciples. You know, it's virtually impossible to exaggerate the importance of love. When we demonstrate Christian love at its highest level, agape love, it distinguishes the believer from the rest of the world. Jesus said, by this people will know. Notice Jesus did not say that people will know you're my disciples by the size of Bible that you have, that you carry around. He didn't say that. Or by when you promote my agenda or where you wear a fish on your lapel. And... No, no. He said, you people will know you're my disciple by the love that you carry in your heart and the way you love one another, the way you push through things with intentionality and authenticity to love one another. Love is never incidental. It's fundamental. It has to be present. It doesn't matter what else is absent if love is present. Show your love today. Show love by listening. We're coming out of a pandemic. There's lots of people with many misgivings and questions. People will want to talk. People will want to offload, share their anxieties, their fears. People in the church and out of the church, maybe in your workplace. Show love by listening. Show love by generosity. Be generous to people. Be generous with your time. If people want to meet you, just create space, create time. Be generous to build good, loving relationships. Show love by encouragement. Lift people up. Affirm people today. Look out for people. Text people. Whatever happens in the, people bring a contribution to the church, text them. Let them know that you've been blessed by it. Because you love them and you want to encourage them to go on to even more. Show love by kindness, acts of kindness. Reflecting the, the heart of God. And, you know, you show love by people by just praying for them. It's the most unselfish thing you can do. By just praying for people and upholding them every day before God. You know, worship, evangelism, prayer... There are great things to have in the church, but they're all dependent on a right relationship. I cannot worship God if I can't talk to the person across the aisle. My worship is invalid. Jesus said that, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled. My evangelism is just hot air if I claim to, to want to love people outside and I can't love people within. Prayer, the Bible talks about prayers being hindered because of wrong relationships, loving one another. There's a little verse in Galatians which I'm going to quote to finish, and it says this Paul writing, The only thing that counts, says Paul, is faith expressing itself through love. We're a community of faith but we want to operate in love, loving one another. 
This is the first rung on the ladder of the Apostles' teaching. But I guess it's the one, probably the most important. That doesn't diminish, devalue what's coming behind, but loving one another. Because when that is present, it doesn't matter what else is absent. The Lord bless you, ICF, and uh, take on board what God's Word is saying to you today. And let's be the church in the Highlands where people are envious of us, people are curious because of those relationships. We stagger people. People will be staggered at what they see as a demonstration of the kingdom of God. The Lord bless you.